Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Michael Zephyr and I'm an associate professor here at the Faculty of Business and Economics at the University of Melbourne. And uh, <clears throat> this is the, uh, the final QMNet talk for 2020. Uh, QMNet standing for the Quantitative Methods Network here at the University of Melbourne. Uh, and today we've got an exciting talk by uh, Jesper Ibsen, uh, who's going to talk on stability and complexity, new insights from random matrix theory. And Jesper is a research fellow in mathematical physics at the School of uh, Math and Stats here at the University of Melbourne, where he's affiliated with the ARC Center of Excellence for Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers, received his undergraduate degree from uh, the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. That sounds like somebody famous. <laughs> <laughs> and, his P and his PhD jointly from Bielefeld uh, University in Germany, obviously, and the Chinese Academy of Science in Beijing um, in China, obviously, again. Uh, his research is focused on <laughs> random matrix theory and its applications in physics, engineering, and biology. And after this talk, maybe you can also include uh, social science, because I think we've got a couple of social science -y people here who... Well, that would be great. Might have to say. Yeah, so feel free to take it away. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Let me just share my screen. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute my 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 uh, audio and video, but I'm still here. I'll just let you do the speaker view. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for letting me talk here. Uh, so. Uh, before I get started, uh, I actually want to put in some other things because every time I talk to a Melbourne audience, I like to just make an advertisement for our random matrix group because we like random matrices and they appear many places nowadays. Uh, and you have some problems where random matrices appear. Uh, please uh, send us an email. Uh, we will be very interested in see what is happening. We are trying to be more interdisciplinary if we can. Uh, yeah, and the second thing I want to say is that uh, I would be cool if we recruit a PhD student. So if anybody know anybody that might be interested in that, uh, please feel free to uh, ask them to send me an email or something. Okay. Okay. To the main topic. So uh, I give the talk this title, Stability and Complexity, Insight for Random Matrix Theory. So I, one of my favorite topic is the uh, random matrix theory. So it's very much that perspective of going into looking at this uh, topic related to complex systems in a more general sense. So I thought originally uh, that I want to talk about a, slight, a couple of different projects, but you know, when you give the title before you actually make the talk, sometimes you change your mind. So this talk will actually mainly be uh, based on this uh, paper that I've put the reference down below. Uh, so maybe a more appropriate title for this talk would be uh, Nonlinearity non Generated Resilience in Large Complex Systems. Uh, which is the written uh, together with uh, Jan Fjordov, that is a professor at King's College in London, and uh, Theo Fedeli, that is a PhD student. And well, I think it should be soon to be ac soon be accepted for publications. Anyway, let's start with the talk itself. So I kind of divided it up in a uh, four chapters. Uh, the first part, I will try to uh, talk a bit about big picture, be quite general uh, about what the overarching goal is, but also very vague. And then in the following two chapters, we will be more uh, concrete. Uh, and first we will talk something about uh, linearization and local stability and well, I have a background in uh, mathematical physics and something we like doing in that area is to uh, look at symmetries or classify everything according to symmetries. So I'm gonna do something like that in this context too. And 
finally we will get to maybe the most exciting part, which is uh, what I call the non-linearity generated resilience. We will return to what exactly that means. Anyway, let's get started. So the big picture. So what we want to uh, uh, talk about here is uh, the system we have in mind is a general uh, dynamical system like d of, uh, dx dt equal to some vector field of, of x here and we will choose it to be some random vector field uh, and do for us to be able to do anything reasonable we will uh, uh, have to have some regularity conditions and some, some different things and the crux of the what we are focusing on is a system that have some given fixed point and we so like the philosophy is like we we look at the vicinity of this uh, fixed point uh, so assume you have one you have your system that you want to study and there's you know this one fixed point and then you want to uh, look at the behavior uh, regarding uh, in the neighborhood of this fixed point or more globally and without loss of generality we will choose this fixed point uh, to be the origin for the rest of this talk of course full disclaimer when you are presenting a dynamical system like that. This is of course so general that it's more or less meaningless. Uh, so I like this, I put this quote by uh, Stanislaw Ulvan uh, in the bottom, which is always a nice one that says, uh, using the term like nonlinear science is like referring to the bulk of zoology as the study of non-elephants. So we will be more concrete later on, but this is more like the big philosophy. And the second thing that I want to kind of get out of the way is that we are so I'm not too familiar with the, the people in this audience, but my impression is that uh, people are in general much more implied than I am. Uh, so let me give a full disclaimer about this too, that our goal is really to start with a very simple model in some sense, uh, that if you are the devil's advocate, might, uh, will claim that are they are unrealistic, not real world models, but the goal is to get some model that we can understand to some deep level, get some good rigorous mathematical theorems about them and then work towards including more features and move them towards more realistic models. Okay. And the second thing I want to emphasize related to this is uh, in a wake sense, what I mean with simple is you can kind of have a what does it mean to be simple? So I'd like to come with this analo uh, analogy from a, a physics that we imagine like you have some particles in box, right? Uh, if you are looking at just one particle in a, in a box, so that's a simple problem, this high school physics. Uh, if you have a lot of particles, uh, like 10 to the 23, uh, then you are in the realm of statistical mechanics and you will ask some different question you will ask, in, in, a, in some way you are considered maximally random systems and you can get some uh, average result out and the intermediate region is really well there's nothing to do except just doing some brute force computer simulation that will kill the, uh, your supercomputer right uh, so in this dynamical system we might imagine that like it's the simple kind of stuff would in like the one particle in a box kind of real more thing would be something like the logistic map, like low dimensional system. These are not the kind of things that we are the theme of what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about 
with more being the theme of a, like what you would call it, like a statistical mechanic approach to uh, to these kind of dynamical system we are talking about. Okay, that's all relatively vague, but let's try to be a bit more concrete. Okay, so uh, our first uh, chapter is called the uh, no, second chapter. Uh, it's called linearization and local stability, and so basically it's based on the. Uh, we want to do some linearization around this fixed point that we have chosen to be at the origin. And well, the nice thing about linear model is of course they are solvable. Uh, uh, they are also a bit boring in that sense, but that would be our first point. Uh, and there would be some interest in the solve related to that nonetheless. Okay, so this is our goal in some sense. You want to uh, look at criteria for when this uh, fixed point in our dynamical system uh, is uh, locally stable or locally unstable. Uh, and why do we want to do that? Well, that's like a natural first step in a stability analysis, analysis of this system. And the how we're going to do this is kind of based on linearization that I always uh, already alluded to, and then some uh, result for random matrix theory. Uh, and we will go uh, through this chapter, and this the outline goes like this. Then we first say some generality, then we want to introduce the model that we're actually going to consider, then we're going to look at some results from random matrix theory. Uh, which will finally allow us to uh, state our main result. And after we have stated the main result about this local stability, we will uh, give some criticism of the results about what we can do better. Okay. Okay. First thing first, uh, this is of course something that I assume everybody knows, but uh, it's always good to repeat nonetheless. So we are consider our dynamical system. Uh, and we want to know if this fixed point that we have uh, included the origin is uh, locally stable. How do we do that? Well, you find the Jacobian or the Jacobian matrix at the origin. And then you look at the uh, eigenvalues of this uh, matrix. And if all the eigenvalues have a real part less than zero, well, then the, the system is stable. And if at least one of the eigenvalues have real part bigger than zero, then it's unstable. Okay. It's relatively well known. Same, it's just a linearization. Okay. But what is the model that we want to consider first? Um, we want to consider a model in which the Jacobian at the origin is given by first this deterministic term minus mu time. Uh, uh, oh, I shouldn't have included the x there. The two x's there should not be there in that equation. Anyway, um, it should be minus mu times the identity matrix uh, plus one over square root in the matrix M. So uh, here mu is uh, some real constant and M is a random matrix. So the interpretation is here that, or the philosophy behind it is that if you take the constant mu to be large, then the system will, uh, the fixed point and the origin will be stable. But then when you, if you decrease mu, then at some point, the eigenvalues of uh, this random matrix M will become important and uh, you will go to an unstable, uh, switch over to an unstable fixed point. So the question is of course, how we choose this 
random matrix M first, and I'll give some justification for it later, but we introduce it first. So I will choose it to be a Gaussian matrix for convenience. And I'll, because it's Gaussian, we had fully defined just by the mean and the covariance, and I define the mean to just be mean zero. And uh, the covariance will have this structure where we have uh, this uh, sigma that will more or less correspond to a uh, standard variation in a range of matrix engine. And then we have this parameter alpha that, will, that can run between minus one and plus one. And it would be an interpo interpolation parameter. And we're going to, to explain what, what it's interp interpolated in between, okay? So, the interpolation alpha. So if you take alpha equals zero, so that is just like here in the covariance that the second term here, the deltas here are Kronecker deltas, right? So delta mn is equal to one if uh, m is equal to n and zero otherwise, okay? Alpha equals to zero, the second term is zero and that corresponds to the case where all the entries of the matrix is ID distributed, okay? When you take uh, alpha e equal to one, will it correspond to the case where uh, the matrix M is uh, symmetric. In this case, uh, all the entries above the diagonal will still be IID, but obviously since this is symmetric, the, when you know the one above the diagonal, you know the one above the diagonal, uh, below the diagonal too. And you take uh, alpha to minus one, it would be skew symmetric or anti-symmetric. And again, the eigenvalues above the diagonal will be IID random variable. So uh, this have a kind of importation when you look at uh, of these parameters. So if it look at these uh, two entrants in the matrix, let's say M uh, I J and MJI, so they switch the indexes. Uh, if they have the same sign, uh, there would be some uh, mutualistic uh, uh, interaction between these two components uh, in the system, so they will benefit each other. Uh, similarly, if they have both have a, a both negative, there will be a be competitive, so they may influence each other uh, negatively in this sense. And uh, um, if they're opposite sign, it will be a parasitic or a predator prey type interactions, okay? So I kind of pull this uh, model out of the blue, but I have actually not just pulled it out of the blue because somebody else had a done exactly this model. Uh, so it really go back to one of the pioneers of uh, complex systems in general, uh, uh, our Australian friend, uh, Bob May, that sadly passed away earlier this year. Uh, so he had this one of many famous paper uh, in 72 in, uh, in Nature, uh, Called, will a large complex system be stable? The model he consider is essentially the alpha equal to zero case of what I just described. Uh, and on the right here, we have a, uh, another paper much more re recent, 2012, which among other things, one of the main things in this paper uh, is they have introduced the interpolation parameter similar to what uh, we have done. So these two papers, to some extent, uh, focus to application in ecology, but we will not particularly 
think about ecology today. Uh, so it might be worth just making a few comments about some other paper related to this uh, uh, topic too. So there's a quite a big gap between uh, 72 and uh, 2012, and, uh, even though the publication avenue is the same. Uh, so from a mathematical point standpoint, it's worth pointing out that there were some issues uh, with the Rika in the result that was stated in May's original paper. Uh, so uh, Charles Newman and uh, Joel Cohen had some papers where they pointed out some counter example. I think maybe there was a bit too, too negative. They kind of interpreted what May said in a very strict mathematical sense, even though it, the paper is not really written in that sense. It could have been a bit, bit more charitable. Um, and uh, so Alessina and Tan, well, they uh, really claim that they have introduced this uh, 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 parameter in this ecological setting, uh, and they are the first to do it. That is in fact not true because some if there was already introduced in 97, but it's kind of in an obscure avenue where nobody knows about it. So this latter uh, paper is uh, definitely the one that popularized it. Okay. Let's uh, continue and try to understand a bit more about what kind of information we go up, get out from these uh, assumptions, okay? So, Our, we will talk about a result from random matrix theory here. So what we need to do is uh, look at the eigenvalues of this Jacobian, right? Okay, we have this, uh, if we go back here, we have the minus mu, forget about this X again, if that was a typo. Uh, so the mu times the identity matrix will just be an overall shift in the, uh, in the spectrum. So the real question is about the spectrum of uh, this matrix M, okay? And it turns out that this type of uh, matrices have a, a spectrum that is uh, distributed within, uh, uniformly within an ellipse in the limit of large N. Uh, and for us, we are interested in, for this particular uh, question about stability, we would be interested in the eigenvalue with the largest uh, real part, which in this case uh, will be uh, sigma times uh, one plus alpha. So. This is where the interpolation parameter come in. We kind of like squeeze the, ipsilon, uh, the uh, ellipse in one direction on the other, depending on whether we take alpha closer to plus one or closer to minus one. And under this assumption of Gaussianity, there will not be any outlier, which is very important. Okay, if we put that back, result back in what we already know about uh, stability, uh, then we get uh, what is sometimes referred to uh, May, uh, May Wigner stability theorem, even though Wigner really didn't have anything to do with it. Um, so we consider this system that we described before, then in the limit of large n, then the fixed point of the origin is uh, locally stable, almost surely if uh, mu is bigger than this threshold that depends on sigma and one plus alpha and is locally unstable almost surely if mu is uh, less than uh, the same threshold here. So one thing that is worth remarking here is that uh, 
the reason that I included the one over square root uh, n in front of the random matrix m here is uh, such that when we consider this uh, stability theorem, we get a uh, nice independent, uh, n independent uh, uh, limit. If we didn't do this one over square root n scaling, that would have a square root uh, n appearing on the right side of these inequalities for larger n. And well, we cannot see things like almost surely, it would be more with high probability and everything a bit less nice uh, mathematically, even though uh, this formulation without the one over n uh, square root n scaling is what you often find in uh, some of these uh, ecological papers. So this is more like a convenient for mathematical convenience we introduce this. Um, so the observation we want to uh, make here uh, that I'm worthwhile to make about this uh, kind of system is that, first of all, there's a sharp, sharp transition between uh, stability and uh, instability. So that would not, uh, is a priori not obvious. Uh, the second uh, observation that's worth making, if we recall our interpretation of this uh, parameter alpha is that when alpha becomes bigger, it uh, favors uh, mutualistic and competitive interaction, while when it becomes smaller, it favors uh, parasitic or predator prey, predator prey, prey type interaction. So what we see here is that uh, parasitic interaction actually are stabilizing, while uh, mutualistic and competitive interactions are destabilizing. Um, whether or not that is surprising, that uh, is not really for me to say. The order of the, the paper on the right here, uh, Le Sino and Tan certainly thought so. You can say there, see there uh, here in the abstracts that one of the things that they emphasize is in fact that predator prey interaction are stabilizing and uh, mutualistic and competitive interactions are uh, destabilizing. Anyway, So one thing I want to uh, emphasize in this setting too is uh, that uh, these kind of random matrix uh, uh, ensembles, this type of random matrices, I mean, that's the kind of stuff I like to uh, look at. Uh, and a, a lot more is known about these kind of uh, These, uh, uh, these ensembles. So one of the things that have quite a literature about is, for instance, uh, distribution of individual eigenvalues close to the edge. And these kind of things uh, we kind of see in this setting will be related to what is going on close to the, uh, in the vicinity of this uh, stability, uh, instability uh, threshold. But this area is basically completely unexplored. Uh, so it's a, a nice thing to, uh, would be a nice thing to explore further. Uh, anyway, this is not the main, uh, what I wanna talk about, it's just a, a side comment. Okay, let's make some, a few criticism of uh, this model that we just considered. Uh, first of all, this uh, assumption of Gaussianity, okay, a lot of people might not like that. We would like to have something uh, more general. Uh, actually, that is no problem at all because we have some strong uh, limit theorems within random matrix theory. So we can actually replace the Gaussian random variables that we have here in the entries of our matrix with any other type of uh, random, random variables as long as we have agreement between the two first moment and uh, 
the fault moments of finance. Uh, to get that, uh, may, uh, that all the, uh, uh, that 100% of the eigenvalues lie within the ellipse actually only requires an assumption on the first two moments, but fault moments are required uh, to uh, ensure that there are no outliers in the spectrum. And when you consider this kind of dynamical system, this uh, outliers can of course be very important. If you have an outlier with the largest uh, real uh, part, then the entire dynamic is driven by this uh, uh, eigenvalue. So that's a big issue. Another very reasonable critique uh, is that uh, well, then we don't have much uh, structure in these uh, matrices. We would like to include whatever our structure is related to whatever system we are considering or whatever real world model we are thinking we are considering. So in the context of ecology, uh, one would like to include some uh, food rep structure, uh, such that uh, tropic levels, modularity, Physicality of the chosen equilibrium, many other things that you might want to include. There's a large literature in particular in ecology, but also in a, uh, a lot of other different settings. Uh, but it will not be our uh, point to explore any of that further today. Uh, what is uh, more in the spirit of today is the, you know, all these linear models that, okay, they're quite fun, but we really want to have something nonlinear that's uh, one of the points. Uh, so the information we get for this uh, linearization is quite limited, right? So, okay, we know there's this, uh, under this assumption that there is this transition uh, sharp transition between stability and instability local. Uh, but first of all, what does it mean when uh, the system is, uh, is uh, uh, when this fixed point is locally stable? Well, I mean, it means that sufficiently small uh, perturbation will converge back to the fixed point. But what is sufficiently small? We would like to know something like what is the uh, uh, fast enough attraction of this uh, fixed point and the origin in the case is stable. And even worse, when the fixed point and the origin is uh, locally unstable, well, then if you give a smaller uh, perturbation to your system, then you will go away from the vicinity of the uh, fixed point and the linear model is just completely useful. So you useless. So you don't know you don't basically don't know anything in the unstable setting. So that is uh, really the main goal of uh, today is to, uh, in kind of like the spirit of uh, uh, these, are, uh, these other models to introduce these higher uh, order model, nonlinear models, uh, in a similar spirit. Uh, of course, the question is kind of, what is the right way to uh, uh, to do that? I mean, a natural way is to include some higher order terms, which uh, is essentially also what we want to do. Uh, but what kind of structure are we going to give to this other, uh, higher order term? Uh, The way I want to uh, look at it is looking at uh, something related to uh, symmetry that we will see uh, very shortly. And this relates us into this uh, final criticism that I point here. Uh, that is, okay, we had this model that had this alpha parameter that can interpolate between uh, anti-symmetric and symmetric matrices. Okay, it seemed quite natural to have this uh, uh, have a model that interpolate between uh, uh, 
anti-symmetric and symmetric matrices that is a mutualistic competitive uh, only uh, interaction only systems versus predator prey type system but there's many ways you can choose such an interpolation. What is so special about this particular version? Okay, for many of the for for the papers uh, like Alessina and Sun is basically because why do they take that model? Well, it, because results about this model exist in the literature, so you can just take it and use it. But uh, I would like to do a bit better. You can do that, and that will relate back to. Uh, talking about symmetry again, when we uh, will introduce some symmetries in a minute and under this new assumption, these parameters will actually be uh, a unique choice. So there's this one unique way to, under this additional uh, assumption, uh, to interpolate between these two case, uh, two, two case scenarios. So that is what we want to go into now. So that's our chapter three, symmetry and classification. Okay. Okay, I kind of always see uh, alluded to uh, to this. Uh, well, not really. Uh, so the symmetry that I want to consider is uh, rotational symmetry or isotropy about this fixed point that we have chosen to be at the origin. And as I already alluded to, uh, the reason why we want to introduce that kind of symmetry is uh, because we will be able to make a full classification of these kind of rotational invariant fields. Uh, and uh, this kind of approach is uh, to some extent based on that uh, Gaussian random fields have some very nice properties and relatively easy to deal with in some sense. Okay. And have a short outline of this uh, chapter too. So first, I will tell you what the uh, isotropy or uh, rotation invariance in this setting really means. Uh, and then I want to mention what this means for uh, linear fields, like the linearization, which I've talked about before. And then we will talk about what it means for nonlinear fields. And finally, again, we will provide a bit of criticism of what we just introduced, okay? So what do I mean by uh, isotropy? So I would like to uh, divide it into three different cases. Uh, when you look at the literature, since I sometimes miss, uh, mix a bit up, um, but uh, I think for our purposes, it's nice to uh, be very concrete and split things up. Uh, so we will have a, what we call almost sure isotropy that is really rotational environment almost sure it is. So that is you just take what, what any point you take in in dimensional occlusion space and you have some rotation R. Uh, so they belong to the orthogonal group. So it's included in, in proper uh, rotation that is reflections. and then you want to say that your uh, field in the invariant in the sense that the equation they are uh, portrayed. Uh, the model that consider this almost sure uh, isotropy is it's very simple because it's a very strict requirement. What we really wanna, the more interesting part comes in when we introduce a statistical isotropy, which is very commonly just referred to isotropy as well. Though. So it's kind of like slightly confusing sometimes, but anyway. Uh, so what do that mean? That means just like we take some positive integer and then we can take this number point in space and we take some rotation again and then the distribution of the, this vector of the, if you rotate this uh, random vector, rotate in the way that you would expect according to rotational invariant, but in a distributional sense. Okay, the final uh, thing I want to make a, a comment that would not be important at first is that there are a weak version of this too, where we don't really require a, a 
this full uh, dis distributional invariance of the vector, but only a invariance of the moments and covariance functions. Uh, so we will mainly focus on the Gaussian field, Gaussian vector, random vector fields. And in this case, the weak version is equivalent to the full version. But in the end, we just make a short remark about uh, non-Gaussian uh, fields. So it's point to keep this in mind for later. Okay. Okay. So if you impose this uh, kind of symmetry condition on uh, a linear field, then we actually get something that looks very similar to uh, the model that I had before. So we will again have like uh, this minus mu x term, that is this deterministic term, and we will have this uh, mx term that is uh, this Gaussian uh, matrix that we had before, and then like, we had that spectrum that is uniformly distributed in on, a, on an ellipse in the complex plane for large n. They're sometimes called the elliptic Gaussian ensemble. There's one more uh, term that I uh, allowed, and that is uh, just a term, just uh, a scale of random variables, uh, Gaussian random variable, because we consider Gaussian field in this case. Um, so the model that we considered before is almost, almost uh, uh, the most general uh, rotational invariant in the statistical sense. Uh, system. So that's in, well, at least to me, that seems nice. Uh, so again, I have introduced this uh, one over square root in uh, uh, constant uh, uh, for convenience. And uh, so this uh, additional uh, xi. Uh, contribution to the linear model that was not before. When we have this one on a square root n, uh, it will not con contribute uh, in the large n limit. So it will uh, uh, we will have the same result as before in the large n limit when we consider these things. If we didn't have the square root n in front of the, the side term as well, then uh, we will get some Gaussian fluctuation to the edge of the spectrum. So we will only be a trivial modification in some sense. Uh, so we may very much carry the results that we had from before over in this uh, isotropic setting, okay? But linear model is not really what we want to uh, consider. We want to consider some uh, non-linear model. Uh, so, um, so, uh, I can I uh, include this assumption uh, that I want to use to define our uh, vector field in, uh, in general. They are slightly overlapping. I could have removed. I want to do, uh, but I think it's more illustrative to uh, include them all. So. The whole uh, parity we want to look at is this system that have this fixed uh, uh, fixed point at the origin. So, of course, we're going to include that very much in the spirit as before. We uh, would like to have a, a system that uh, uh, can uh, be expanded around this fixed point, and the way to do this mathematically is just. Uh, not try to uh, look at red. Uh, we have a vector field that is uh, actually has an expansion, but does it to define your vector fields at the expansion. So that is what we want going to do. We just uh, imagine you have a, uh, uh, some uh, Taylor McLaurin series and a uh, thread out then uh, having whatever these. Uh, uh, constant you would have in your expansion, you will just uh, 
introduce some random variables and the field you're considering are uh, fields you can define in this way, assuming you have a convergence. So you want to have, in principle, anything with the finite convergent, uh, uh, fi finite uh, radius of convergence would work, but uh, from the sim simplicity, let's just say that uh, the radius of convergence is assumed to be infinity. Okay, the third assumption we have is that uh, we consider Gaussian fields come with a lot of benefits technically. Uh, and uh, one of the benefits is that we uh, can define our field just from the mean function and the covariance function. And the final uh, assumption is this uh, rotational invariant, invariance in the statistical sense that we introduced just before. Oh, I'm talking. I'm going a bit too slow. I better be a bit quicker. Anyway. Uh, so, uh, the point is, when we have these assumptions, then uh, we can generalize uh, to a nonlinear field. Uh, and since it looks very much the same, so rather, rather than before, we now have a, rather than we just had this mu constant, it will now be some function that depends on uh, x dot x, so that's just a usual inner product. So something that depends on the distance to the origin. And similar, uh, the psi that was just a random variable before is now a random function that only depends on the distance to the origin squared. Um, and then these two first term is the part that are almost surely isotropic, and it's kind of like the boring part of the system. The intermittent part comes in the last uh, field phi. Uh, so the general structure of this uh, will be the one I have given here be below. It will assume that it has mean zero because we're taking that part out. Uh, and uh, it has uh, this structure where there are these two uh, functions, A and B, which also will be given as this uh, power series because our function F is assumed to be defined through this uh, uh, series, power series itself, okay? Okay, uh, so uh, we are uh, gonna give a little bit interpretation of these uh, things. So that we have some inequality that come from requiring that uh, here, the first point here will be that kind of what we can call a generalized curl uh, is positive, it's just a variance of, uh, of this. And of course, it's some expectation of something square is going to be positive. And uh, equality in this case would correspond to conservative fields. And like, like we, the variance of the divergent must also be, uh, be uh, positive. So that gives us some inequality here. The inequality corresponds to incompressible field. And this implies this uh, uh, inequality that comes on the uh, constant here that was appearing in our uh, power series just before. Okay, the upper level, uh, upper, upper bound uh, uh, corresponds to the conservative field, and the lower bound uh, corresponds to incompressible field. Okay, very quickly some some example that appear there is just a uh, just to say that this, uh, as someone, uh, even if you don't think about uh, uh, rotational invariant fields, these uh, come kind of natural uh, examples out just by thinking about taking things where you take everything to be independent. So if you just took your uh, vector field uh, uh, file there, take the n, n, uh, n entry in your vector, and just assume that this is this expansion where each term it have a, is multiplied by a, a standard Gaussian random variable with some this constant alpha here, uh, and the alpha can be innocent as soon as uh, long as uh, we have a, a conversion series. Um, that will indeed be uh, something that fall in this uh, 
model where in, in this case would be equal to zero. Okay, you can do the same with the, uh, some conservative field, but I don't want to go more in detail with the, that because we kind of running out of time. Um, okay, some quick uh, uh, criticism. One of the thing is uh, you might kind of get rid of this uh, uh, Gaussianity. Uh, so one thing, so because I'm a little bit short on time, I'm not going to say too much about it, but um, there are some, when you want to uh, generalize a thing to a, to an un-Gaussian field, it's a, worth well, noting there's like only one way to be Gaussian, but there are many ways to be non-Gaussian. So it's not completely uh, always clear what you want to, what people uh, mean when they say non-Gaussian in the setting. But anyway, what is maybe more interesting is, uh, okay, this uh, model is very much built on this uh, rotation invariance, but the model that you have in mind might not be a rotational invariant. What are you gonna do about that? Well, uh, if you just drop it completely, then you're kind of back to square one, but you can kind of uh, try to break it in a controlled way. So one of them is like, just multiply your vector fields uh, with a matrix uh, A outside and a matrix B inside. And you can actually include a lot of interest in a more structure in this way but in a controllable way where techniques that I'm talking about kind of carry through. Uh, okay. The last two points I kind of want to skip because I'm a little bit short on time. Okay. We get to the main point here and that is uh, this uh, non-linearity non generated resilience. Okay. This is our uh, point in this uh, section is that, uh, okay, we look at the, we have this system where there is a uh, fixed point at the uh, at B origin, but it's never natural to ask, well, is there, well, we have this nonlinear generalizations. This is quite a large class of models. Okay. Uh, is, there, is there any other fixed point uh, uh, and where are they located? I mean, that's a, that would be the question we want to ask in this chapter. And well, why do we want to ask that? Because, well, that's a very natural next step in analyzing uh, uh, these systems. And uh, approach is again based on some technique from random matrix theory and something called the Kak Rice formula. Let me skip the outline. It's clear from what we are going through. So we've got to look for fixed point of this system. We know that it's a, uh, 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 a fixed point at the origin, but uh, uh, what else? So uh, the way you can do that is that something called the cut rice formula, that uh, cuts the rice formula that are gonna help you do that. Uh, basically, it will give you the mean density of the fixed point uh, through this formula. There will be this uh, uh, determinant of this uh, matrix and here we have P that is the joint uh, probability density function of the vector field itself and the Jacobian matrix field, okay? Of course, there's some assumptions that need to be satisfied for uh, us to apply this, but under the assumption we introduced before, these Gaussian fields are very nice and everything works out uh, uh, nicely. So let's not worry too much about it, okay? Um, yeah. I just uh, say here that uh, I uh, that uh, focus on the uh, uh, case where there was these two our general nonlinear field was described by these two functions a and b. Let's just consider the case where b equals zero from simplicity. Uh, this is what we have published. Uh, the full general case is uh, work in progress, but should appear in not too long. Um, Okay, uh, yeah, um, so we know the covariance function and therefore we also know the covariance function of the uh, field and the Jacobian uh, matrix itself, uh, the, their covariance function. So essentially we can write down the uh, probability density function. Uh, it's more complicated than uh, 
I mean, in principle, it's about inverting the covariance matrix, but in practice, uh, that uh, can be quite challenging. But since I uh, kind of short on time, I'm not going to speak too much about it, just say that it can be done. Uh, it all depends on this function A in some way, and you can plug it back into uh, the Kac Rice formula, and uh, you get some new expression out. Uh, okay, uh, and what is good for me uh, and people like me that like random maker theory is that this uh, new uh, term has this last term that is this. Uh, expectation value of this absolute value of a determinant that includes some random matrix and this diagonal matrix, okay? Uh, this is something you can uh, analyze with uh, some more sophisticated methods within the random matrix theory, but I'm not gonna go into that because, yeah. Uh, let me just give the very much the conclusion of what happens when you actually do this uh, uh, analysis. And, uh, so what you will observe is that in, in this kind of system is that uh, when the fixed point is stable, uh, the, uh, is locally stable at the origin, well, then there also exists a positive radius uh, R star. Uh, so this will in general depend on the function uh, A and B. So if you know something concrete, you can say concretely what it is, but uh, when we keep things subtract, uh, the only thing we can really say is that in this regime, they are, there's a positive radius. And what, why, what do this positive radius give you then? Say that within a radius of this, uh, a radius of this in the ball with this radius around the origin, there will be no other uh, um, fixed point. So the, interpretation that one would like to give to that is like that this is some kind of uh, resilience radius, right? It's a, we expect that uh, if your perturbation are small, so small compared to uh, this R uh, star, then it will stay within uh, the bastion of attraction. Uh, on the other hand, when you go beyond this R star radius, then there will be uh, a lot of fixed points. So the, in any ball with a radius larger than R star, there will be uh, the number of fixed points will uh, grow exponentially with M. Okay. Uh, now, if you then take your uh, parameter and go towards the limit where uh, the, uh, you, you reach the instability uh, Uh, threshold, then this uh, R star radius, the resilience radius, goes to zero. Uh, and when you reach this, the threshold itself is exactly the point where this radius becomes zero. And beyond this threshold, uh, you can show that in any ball of any radius surrounding the, the origin, the number of uh, a fixed point would go exponentially with n again. So uh, basically that is saying that uh, when you're in the unstable phase, there's just a lot of other fixed points in the very near vicinity of uh, our original fixed point. So we would expect that uh, this system would be extremely sensitive uh, to all the perturbation that you are in introducing, okay? So I think I've already got a few minutes over time, so let's better stop like here. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, does uh, anybody, uh, let me just open it up here. Let's open it up here for questions. Uh, does anybody have anything? <laughs> Okay, there's one in the chat. Um, 
So I'll, uh, 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 Jesper, just for the video, because this is not, I don't think this is recorded. So why don't I read it out just so it will be on the video. So it says, uh, thanks Jesper, this is from Patrick. Uh, I have a couple questions, but it's a bit uh, noisy. So anyway, it says, uh, the alpha in your model, is it correct to read this as the correlation between the individual variables? And then he says, uh, is there a link between the big N and the value of alpha? Uh, for example, multivariate normals, uh, you can have bivariate normals, which have correlation negative one, but it is impossible to have three normals, which all have negative one correlation. Secondly, is that uh, KP fonts plus Beamer you're using? Beautiful slides. <laughs> uh, okay, can I remember all these questions? What, what, uh, so, well, it's, it's in the chat. Yeah. It's in the chat. So if you look at the chat. Yeah, let me right just see here. Uh, if, okay, I'm a bit hard to see it when I uh, yeah, yeah, share yeah, my yeah. screen. Anyway. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, so yeah, uh, first, the parameter alpha, yes, uh, is a, and a, it's directly related to the correlation between uh, the two uh, entries uh, opposite uh, the diagonal. So M, uh, IJ, and uh, uh, MJ, uh, JI. So they are uh, either independent in the alpha equals zero to or uh, positively correlated or negatively correlated in this other sense. So yes. Uh, or is there a link between the, the N, the capital N and the alpha? No, these are not related in any way. Uh, uh, yeah, so this kind of goes to the second one. And I think that's, yeah, they're basically not related. Uh, they're just independent parameters. Okay. Uh, does anybody have uh, anything else they want to ask? Uh, one thing I was wondering is <clears throat> uh, how we can take some of these ideas and apply them to cases wherein we have um, some unknown number of uh, attractors. Um, so, I mean, this is kind of an emerging field of interest, I think, for um, particularly with for the application of kind of AI and machine learning approaches to um, try and figure out what, uh, you know, kind of the uh, some of the topological features of a manifold that would describe uh, a complex dynamic or nonlinear dynamical system where you have we'll just assume that it's <clears throat> fixed uh, over time, I guess, meaning that, um, that the manifold itself doesn't change. But, um, but if you have some unknown number of attractors, some um, right, uh, um, <clears throat> and, and, and you want to talk about concepts, you want to use concepts like stability or critical transitions, or right, there's this whole kind of language around trying to describe how systems might shift, for example, the Lorenz attractor from one lobe to another, et cetera. Um, how can uh, some of the concepts that, that you're using and some of the tools um, kind of, do you think be generalized? How can they be generalized to um, these more complex um, cases? Well, if, I mean, uh, so, uh, in many ways, essentially, there are some of these things are already uh, 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 done. So, uh, yeah. uh, so uh, this uh, uh, point that we had uh, uh, here, that you had uh, this one fixed point that is fixed, is uh, yeah. uh, kind of different from uh, most of the literature that consider Gaussian field in this sense, because. Uh, in yeah. some ways, it's actually harder. Uh, yeah. What people usually want to have is, uh, uh, for simplicity, is fields that are translation invariant in some way, or something on a sphere that is uh, rotational invariant. Uh, right. And some are, so some are in different settings, for instance, very much this uh, similar approach, uh, or a similar technique. So relation with random matrix theory and uh, um, Kac-Weiss formula to look at a fixed point are, for instance, used to look at a Lost, uh, lost landscapes in a uh, machine learning uh, uh, tool. So that's a, uh, 
a number of papers. So the yes. most popular is like a recent one with Lekung. That's very much the uh, same kind of uh, techniques. Um, so yeah. Right. There are. It just depends on a bit what you uh, want to consider in a, in a, in different set. And uh, I would say that these models are also to a very large extent like a, a very strong characters of uh, characters of uh, the what like uh, well very simplified comp compared to what uh, the engineer's perspective. But I mean. Uh, to gain some uh, understanding of some of the more fundamental uh, uh, features. Uh, there are some uh, approaches that are going down. But I mean, yeah, it uh, depends a little bit on what you want to say. And of course, what kind of assumption you put in is essentially what you get out. These are the kind of models uh, we do not expect to have something corresponding to this. Uh, uh, resilient radius uh, of the models I know. Uh, uh, the fixed points uh, tend to be either uh, all distributed in some kind of Gaussian way around some place in the in, in space or uniformly distributed in some kind of way under the assumption that people usually do in these kind of settings. Right. All right. Okay, uh, <clears throat> we've kept everybody, I think, 10 minutes after. To, uh, unless anybody has anything else, let's, uh, should we call it a day? And we'll let uh, Jesper get back to, uh, to whatever, whatever you have going on in the garage there and, <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of the Friday and the weekend. Is that it? Okay, great. Well, thank you uh, so much, Jesper. Uh, we appreciate it. This is the, the last talk of the year and, uh, and, and I'm, you know, especially doing it so late in, in December uh, is, is such a nice thing for you to have done. So thank you very much. And, uh, and we'll see, uh, we'll see everybody next year. Thanks for letting me talk. Yeah, for sure. Have a nice Christmas, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> see ya.